Welcome to this webinar hosted by Tordex entitled Demystifying Device Tree for NXP I.MX Processors. My name is Brandon Shibley. I'm a solutions architect at Tordex, and I'm joined by our guest, Sergio Prado, trainer and technical director at Embedded Labworks. Sergio and his company, Embedded Labworks, are a good partner of Tordex, specializing in consulting and training services and embedded systems such as Tordex products. I want to thank everyone for coming. We've been really looking forward to doing a webinar on device trees. It's one of the biggest topics in our customer support, so I'm really excited for this webinar. Our goal at Tordex is to make embedded computing easy, which is no simple feat, but uh, webinars are one way for us to target the topics which are most challenging for our customers, so we would love your feedback about how we can do that better. And I hope all of you can find this webinar about device trees to be very helpful. For those of you that are unfamiliar with Toradex, we specialize in embedded computing solutions, particularly ARM-based system on modules or SOMs. We have two families of SOMs, which the modules are pin compatible and interchangeable. And the modules you see here on the right side of the screen are part of our Calibri family of modules. We perform hardware and software development in-house. We generally guarantee 10-year product lifecycle support we offer free technical support directly from our developers. Sales are also handled directly by Toradex and our products can be ordered right from our website. And finally, we have offices throughout the world allowing us to serve the needs of regional markets with local warehouses and local sales and technical support. I briefly introduce you to our Calibri modules on the previous slide. This graph illustrates our portfolio of NXP-based Calibri modules. This webinar is focused on NXP I.MX, and you can see here that Toradex provides a range of I.MX based products arranged by price and uh, performance here on the chart. Calibri IMX6 and IMX7 have been very popular, and we're excited to have the new Calibri IMX6 ULL coming soon, which will be very power and cost efficient. Additionally, the next generation I.MX8 based Calibri modules coming sometime next year. And speaking of IMX8, we've already announced our first IMX8 product with our Apollos family of modules, the Apollos IMX8 Quad Max. All of these new products will be offering optional Wi Fi and Bluetooth on the computer module. And we're very excited about all that, so don't hesitate to contact us if you'd like to discuss any of our products further. Finally, before I pass the webinar on to uh, Sergio, I'd like to highlight the design resources available from Toradex. These include our developer website with hundreds of technical articles at developer.toradex.com, videos such as our past recorded webinars, product demos, customer spotlight videos. You can find those also at toradex.com slash pt underscore br slash videos. You can see the link here on the slide. And our community website, which is similar to Stack Overflow, but stocked full of Toradex engineers, all at community.toradex.com. So uh, feel free to go there and ask your questions, you know, technical related. And again, the developer website is a great resource searching all those technical articles there. So lastly, you can contact us directly via email or the contacts at any of our local offices. So without further ado, I will pass the webinar on to Sergio. Thank you for the introduction, Brandon. And hello all, my name is Sergio Prado. I'm the technical director of Embedded Labworks. And Embedded Labworks is a company located in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And we do, we are specialized in software and firmware development for embedded systems. So we provide consulting and development and especially training services on a lot of topics related to embedded systems. So we have a training on embedded Linux where we teach how to build Linux distribution from scratch for an embedded system. We have a training session on Linux device driver development, where we learn all of the, the kernel APIs related to, to Linux device driver development, including device tree. We have an embedded Android session where we learn how to develop for uh, embedded systems using Android. Uh, we learn the internal uh, operation of Android, how it works internally. 
uh, we have training on the Octo projects where we learn how to to build a, a distribution using the tools from the Yocto project. So in our website, we can have a, a good look at what we do. For the last six years, we have presented more than 200 trainings here in, in Brazil. And we have small, big, and medium-sized clients like Samsung, LG, Qualcomm, uh, a lot of research, research institutes here in Brazil we have uh, as our uh, customers. Well, I'm the technical director and the trainer from the Bad Labs. I'm also very active here in the Embedded Systems community in Brazil. I am the creator of a website called Embarcados. It's like uh, embedded.com from the US. I'm also the administrator of a group called CIS Embarcados. That's the oldest embedded system group in Brazil. I write in my blog for more than 10 years. Uh, about embedded system and embedded Linux. I'm also uh, a very fan and I love uh, open source and free software. So I try to uh, contribute to open source projects. I contribute to the Beauty Hoot, that, that's a good system. I contribute to the, to the Linux kernel, and some other open source projects. Okay, let's start our webinar. So our, our idea here is to talk about device tree. That's not a, an easy topic and I will do a, or, or I will try to do a 30 minutes presentation on device tree. Of course that is not enough to learn everything about device tree but uh, we will try to get a big picture on what is a device tree how it works and how can we learn more about device tree. And then after the 30 minutes presentation, I will try to do a hands-on here. I have a Teradex module connected on my computer and I will try, we, we will try to create some device trees and customize device tree and see how it works in practice. And then the final 10 minutes, we're going to, to answer some questions from you. Okay, to start, uh, before talking about device trees, let's try to understand the problem. What's the problem the device tree is trying to solve? So any operating system needs to know the hardware, it needs to know about the hardware. So, how many CPUs do you have? How many memory? Uh, what is the initial address of the memory? How many buses? Which bus do you have? What is connected to which bus? So every operating system needs to know about the hardware so we can instantiate the drivers and boot the system. There are some architectures that helps the operating system, in our case, the Linux kernel, to identify the hardware. So one good example is the PC platform or the x86 platforms. The PC platform has a motherboard that has a firmware on it, right? So we use it to call that firmware BIOS. Today it's called UFI. And this firmware has a component inside called ACPI that one of its objectives is to help the Linux kernel to identify the hardware in this system. So the, the ACPI will describe the hardware to the Linux kernel. And then the PC architecture, the x 86 mainly uses two kind of buses, the USB bus and the PCI bus. And basically everything you connect to a PC, you connect it to a PCI bus or USB bus. So both of, the, of these buses out enumerate the devices to the kernel. So the kernel doesn't need to know that you plug keyboards in the USB port because the USB uh, bus will uh, out enumerate the, the device to the kernel. The kernel will know that you and connect keyboard to the USB slot. So in practice, the x86 
platform doesn't, we don't have this problem in the PC and x86 platform because the hardware subscribes itself to the kernel. But what about other platforms like our PC, in our case, ARM? We don't have this kind of feature normally. So there is no easy way for the kernel to know the hardware that uh, it is using. So for example, the kernel doesn't know that you put a LLD in the GPIO 3.5. The kernel doesn't know that you put an accelerometer in the iTunes I square C bus 2 and its address is 10. So how does the kernel know that what is in the hardware? Well, for some time we solved this issue describing the hardware in the kernel source code. So I have here some snippets from the Linux kernel source code to show you uh, how it was done. And actually, it's still, this code still exists uh, in some cases uh, because it wasn't yet ported to the device tree model. But we, we're going to get there. So this is an example I take from the Linux kernel source code for a specific Linux ARM board, right? So it's a .c file that has a lot of structures describing the hardware for the kernel. So we are seeing here a structure called I2C board info. That structure is declaring uh, hardware that's connected to the I2C bus. We have here uh, EEPROM, AT24. We have here real-time clock, CF8563. We have here a uh, sensor. I think it's a temperature sensor, LM75. So we're going to use this structure to uh, register these devices in the kernel. So the kernel, you know that we have these devices connected to the I2C bus. I have here another example using the SPI bus. So here we are declaring, declaring to the kernel that we have uh, 80 25, I think this is a EEPROM. Yes, this is a EEPROM. So we have AT25 connected to the SPI bus. It has the ship select one. That's the maximum speed of the ship. So we are declaring in the kernel source code the hardware. And then there is function that the kernel will call in the boot to initialize the bird. So in, in this case, in this example, that's the function. PCA 100 uh, underscore init. This function will register all the devices in the kernel. So we can see here that is registering, for example, the UART port, the MMC uh, card interface, the main flash. Here in these last two functions, it is registering the devices that we saw in the last slides. So here it is registered in the I square C one that those three devices that we saw in the last slide. And in this function SPI register board if it is registered that SPI device, the EU ROM uh, in the kernel. So for those of you who are not kernel developers, don't worry about it details. Just uh, try to get the big picture here. What is happening? We are using the Linux kernel source code to define the hardware, to describe the hardware to the kernel. And that's not good because if you have one, two, three boards, you can maintain easily this code. But if you have 100, 200, 1,000 boards, imagine the confusion to uh, maintain all of this code inside the kernel. So the maintenance is the big problem. Describe, describe the hardware in the, the Linux kernel code comes with a lot of disadvantages. For example, if you change anything in the hardware, you have to 
change the kernel, so it's code, rebuild the kernel, and generate another image of the kernel. You're not adding a new feature to the kernel, you just describe a new hardware. So you change the hardware, you have to change the kernel source code, and that's not good. Since there is no standard way to, to implement this uh, hardware registering during the boot, uh, every manufacturer can do in its own way. So if we work with one manufacturer, we will see codes that do something in a way. If we work with another manufacturer, it could do another way. So there is no standard. It's more difficult to maintain this code. If we have two similar boards, we'll have to duplicate its code and change uh, what needs to be changed. So we will have uh, more duplicated code because we have to register harder inside the kernel source code, so that's not good. Another problem is that imagine we have a, a line of products that is very similar in, in, in some ways. We want to keep just one kernel image for all of this line of products, but it's more difficult to, to, to do that if you are uh, register the hardware inside the kernel source code, since the kernel will become dependent of the hardware. So we have a lot of disadvantages doing that. That's where it comes to device trip. So the idea here is to remove from the Linux kernel source code code that describes the hardware. So we're going to describe the hardware in a file that's separated from the kernel. We are going to use a human readable file, so a text file with a specific syntax to describe the hardware. That file is called DTS, Device Tree Search. It has the extension .dts. And we're going to see it in the next slide. It looks like an XML or JSON file. It's a file, it's a structured file with nodes, subnodes, and properties. Each property is a key value pair. This text file will be compiled to a binary version that's called device free binary blob. Its extension is DTB. And this DTB file is going to be passed to the kernel at boot. So at boot, the kernel will interpret, will parse the DTB, identify all of the hardware, and boot the system. In that way, uh, we can have a single image of the kernel to be used in any boards we want. We only have to make sure that we pass the kernel the right device tree blob so the kernel can boot the, the right hardware. So that's the, the way it works. The device tree project is not new, actually, it's pretty old. And if, not, if I'm not wrong, it was created in the 90s in a project called Open Framer by some microsystems that was used in conjunction with, with Solaris in Spark platforms. So it's quite old, the, the device tree. Some years later, it was adopted by the PowerPC community in 2005. Uh, it becomes mandatory in PowerPC, the use of device tree. On ARM, uh, it becomes mandatory on version 3.7. Although it was used before, but it wasn't mandatory. But in, in version 3.7 of the Linux kernel, it became mandatory to use a device tree on ARM platforms. As far as I know, uh, today the device tree is used on ARM, PowerPC, OpenWiz, Arc, and Microblaze, and Spark. Well, where the device tree is located? The device tree is located in the Linux kernel source code. So, in our case, we are going to work with ARM. So, the device tree for the ARM boards is located in Arch, ARM, Boot, the test inside the Linux kernel source code. So for every board, we're going to have a DTS file. 
for every board, we're going to have a DTS. You can see here that we have a DTS I file. That's an include file. We're going to talk about it soon. What is this DTS I file? The DTS file is the final device tree. Every and single board has a DTS file in this directory. This file needs to be compiled, so there is a compiler called DTC, the Device Tree Compiler. We can use it directly to compile a DTS and generate a DTD, but it's not common. The, the, the compiler is located, there is actually a separated project for this compiler, but it is also located in the Linux kernel source code inside the directory script DTC. We have there the compiler and some tools to work with device tree. As I was saying, it's not necessary to run di directly the compiler, the DTC. What is done is the make file, the kernel make file is changed. So uh, we can call some targets of the make file to compile the device trees. We have a target called DTBS. If we run make DTBS, we're going to compile all of the device trees for the boards that are enabled in the kernel configuration. So in the kernel configuration, we can enable different boards and platforms. When we run make DTBS, it will compile and generate all of the TDs for all, for all of the platforms that is enabled in the Linux kernel configuration. If we want to compile just one device tree, we can run make passing the name of the device tree. It also works. So here I'm compiling the device tree for the IMX6 Colibri module from Teradex. After the compilation, the DTB, the compiled device tree, will be also located in the same directory as the source, Arch Army Boot DTS. Then the last step is to pass this DTB to the kernel. So who is going to do that? The bootloader. The idea here is to copy the device tree to memory and indicate to the kernel where the device tree was copied. So that is a standard for every actor, architecture. In ARM, the bootloader will copy the device tree, the DTB file to a specific location in memory, could be any location in memory, and we'll save the initial address of the device tree in a register, in a CPU register. I think it's R1 or R2. Then, during the boot, the kernel will take a look at the register. It will go to memory, read the device tree, validate, parse it, and boot the system. That's the general idea. Today, the, the two main bootloaders used in ARM, U-Boot and uh, Bearbox, they support the, this feature of passing the device tree to the kernel. If you are using a bootloader that doesn't support passing the device to the kernel, or you are using a U-Boot version too old, uh, like more than 10 years ago, you will have to do something different if you want to boot with a device tree. There is a way to do that. If the bootloader doesn't know how to pass the device tree to the kernel, you still can boot a kernel with a device tree. And the, the way you will do is that you, you will enable a config option in the kernel. That's the config option. Config army append the DTB. And then you will create an uh, image that will have the kernel image and the device tree concatenated, appended. So you will append the device tree image in the kernel image, generate a single image with both images, and then boot that image. During the boot, the kernel will verify that the, you enable the config arm appended in the TB. Then the kernel will go to the final of his image, parse, load the device tree, parse, and 
uh, identify the hardware and boot the system. So that's how it's done if you're using a, an old bootloader or a bootloader that doesn't support device. Very good. So what we have seen until now is how to use a device tool, right? Let's now take a look how it works. Let's take a look at some of the syntax and the semantics of the device tool. In general terms, the idea here is to uh, describe the hardware using a data structure, right? So what is the hardware? We have to describe the CPUs, we have to describe the memory, we have to describe the I.O. devices, right? And to describe the I.O. devices, we, we will also describe the buses that these I.O. devices are connected. Great. This is the syntax of the device tree. Let's take a look and try to understand how it works. So we can see from this slide that looks a little bit like an XML or JSON file, right? We have nodes, should be nodes, properties. Okay, well, the first node that we call the root node starts with a slash. That's the root node. It's where it starts. Where, where everything starts. And then we have some nodes inside the root node. That's the node zero, node one. Uh, there is a convention on defining the node name. You can, we can see here a, a, this convention, this standard. So we, we give it a naming and we define an address. The idea here is to use the address of the device. So each node will describe a device. The idea here is to put here the address of the device. So if you're describing a device like UART port that has its registers mapped in memory, you have to put here the initial address of the registers that are memory mapped. If you are describing a device that's connected to I square C bus, you have to put here the address of the device in the i square c bus. But it's just a convention you could put here any name you want. And for some devices, you don't need to put an address. Like uh, if you're describing a, an LLD, an LLD, it doesn't have an address. So you could put just here the name of the LLD. There's no problem. So I have here one note. No, it starts and finishes here. And here, another node. Here, this node has a label. So the node at one, that's the name of the node. It has a label. Its name is node one. So I, the, the idea here is to reference this node anywhere in the device tree. So if I want to reference this node above or below the definition, I can. I just have to use the understand symbol. Like here, here I have a property. We're going to talk about properties now. Here I have a property that references this node. We are talking about the syntax here. In the next slide, we're going to see how it is used. So the semantics of this, right? Right now, it's just the syntax of the device tree. Inside a node, we can put properties and Sub nodes or child nodes, right? So here I have some properties. I can have, there are some types of properties. So here I have a string property. Here I have a list of string properties separated by a comma. Here I have properties of that have bytes, right? I use the square brackets. Here I have a property that declare just an Consigned an integer. Here I have a property, the first child property, that's a property uh, that can be used as a flag, right? The device driver can use this property to check if it's enabled or not and do something different. Okay, and inside the node zero, we have two child nodes and we could have more child nodes inside. That's why we call device tree, right? It's a tree of device. Okay, that's the syntax of the device tree. Let's talk now a little bit about the semantics, taking a look at a real piece of device tree. So here we have a 
node that describes a UART port. This is the name of the node, the serial at 0202000. Oh, that's the name of the node. And it has a label that we could reference anywhere in our device tree. We're going to see in the next slide that we can use this label to change any of the properties of the node. Inside of the node that is describing a serial port, we have the properties of this serial port. One of the main, if not the main properties of a device node in the device tree is the compatible property. That property is going to be used by the kernel to identify the driver that's going to handle this node in the device tree. So we're going to see the snippets of the device driver code in the next slides. We're going to see how it is done in the device driver. But the device driver is going to register in the kernel saying that it is able to handle devices compatible with FSL, uh, IMX6Q, UART. And then when the kernel finds a node in the device tree with that compatible, it will call a function from the driver. The probe function from the driver is going to see in the next slide. So that, that's one of the main properties in a device tree node. We have here in the end a uh, stats property that's, that's also an important property because the stats property allows us to enable or disable a node in a device tree. So if the kernel, when it is uh, parsing a node, finds the stats property with the value disabled, it won't uh, call the device driver probe function. It means that this node is disabled, this device is disabled. So a way to disable a device in the system, you could disable the driver in the kernel or you could disable the device in the device tree using this property status. So in this case, the kernel won't call the device driver probe function because the status is disabled. If you want the kernel to call the, the device driver probe function and instantiate the driver to handle this device, you have to change this property to OK. You have to put OK here. I don't know why it's not enabled, because starts go disabled, disable the node. Starts go enable could enable the node, but it doesn't. It should be OK. So starts equal OK to enable. If you don't put a starts property, it means it's enabled. So if it doesn't have the stats, it's enabled. You have to be explicit to disable the node in the device tree, to disable the device in the device tree. All right, and here we have uh, another properties. We have here a property called HAG. Here we have the description of the, the address of the registers of this device. So this device uses memory mapped I.O. It's a memory mapped I.O. device. It's registered as mapped in RAM memory. And this is the initial address. And this is the size of the block of registers of this device. If you open the reference manual of the IMX processor, you will see that this is the address of the UART1 device, right? because this information is in the reference manual of the processor. Here we have the interrupt properties. So the IMX6 uses the interrupt number 26 for the UART1. And we need this information in the device driver to register the interrupt handler and handle the interrupts of this device. So it is uh, defined in the device tree. Right. So the idea of the device tree, as you can see, it's to register the, the devices, describe the hardware, and all the information needed by the drivers to handle this device. Like in this case, the address of the registers, the interrupt number, 
the clocks that, that it's going to use, the DMA channels that it's going to use, all of the information that is needed to handle this device. Here we have a snippet from the driver that will handle this node in the device tree. So the driver will declare a struct called OF device ID. Uh, basically, basically, almost all of the device tree APIs in the kernel starts with OF. It comes from Open Firmware. So if you see a function that starts with OF underscore, it's related to device tree. In this case, it's a structure that we are going to use to declare uh, our compatibility. So in our device driver, you're going to say, I'm compatible with this device, this device, this device. So in this case, we can handle three uh, different devices in one single device driver. And then this structure is initialized in a, in a field of another structure. That's the platform driver structure because our driver is a platform driver. And then this platform driver structure is going to be registered in the kernel source code when this driver is loaded in the boot. And when that happens, the kernel will do the match because it knows that there is a device in the device tree that says it is compatible with FSL, coma, MX, Sys, Q, and it's going to see that there is a driver for that device. And then the kernel will call this function probe. And this function probe will uh, start to talk with the device. In this case, create a TTY uh, to access the serial port, right? And it's going to use a lot of functions to access the information in the device tree, like uh, this function platform get our IRQ is going to return that number 26. So the driver can uh, register uh, an IRQ handler for this IRQ. And that's how it's done. So uh, the idea here is, uh, again, to describe the hardware and all the information needed for the device driver to work. And then when the kernel handle a node, it will uh, try to find a device driver that knows how to uh, handle that node, instantiate that driver, and then everything works. I have here another example. This example uh, is for the uh, an audio codec. It's the SGTL 5000. Uh, its properties are simple. It has a compatible and a reg and a cox, so only three properties. We're going to see in the end of the presentation uh, how can we identify the properties that we should use in a specific device. So I want to add the device X. Uh, and what should I do? We're going to do that in uh, the hands-on. In the device driver code for this audio codec, again, we have that structure of device ID that defines it is compatible with the FPS cell comma SGTL 5000, then it registered that in the kernel, and then when the kernel finds the node in the device tree, node that has a driver that knows how to handle that node, it will call the probe function from the driver. And then the probe function will do its work, talk to the hardware, access the hardware, export an interface to the user to talk to that device. Very good. Uh, so now we saw the snippets of the device tree. Let's see, let's, let's try to, to, to have a big picture of the uh, whole device tree, a more complete device tree. So there are some properties that was defined and we're going to use by default. Uh, what are that, 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 these properties? The model properties uh, is going to to define the or describe the hardware, it's a string that will describe the hardware. It's the it's, it is just informational. We also have the compatible properties.
how we saw the compatible property inside a node, the kernel will use that property to do a match with a driver. What about a compatible uh, property that is inside the root node of the device tree? The kernel will use that property to identify the board that is booting. It needs that information to uh, run some startup code specific for that board or the platform of, of that board. Then we have a node called CPUs. Its objective is to describe the CPUs in the system. Then we have a node that describes the memory. And then a node that we use to pass uh, parameters to the kernel like the kernel command line, it's the chosen node. Then we have, we could have a node called aliases to define some aliases for certain nodes, like uh, we want to call the node for the internet controller, we want to call it network. We can create a aliases for that. The alias can be used in the kernel source code to identify faster some node inside the device tree. After that, we should describe the buses in the system and the devices connected to the buses. Here we have an example that I created. Of course, the bird doesn't exist. I just created a dummy device to example to exemplify what we have seen so far. Uh, we have here the model, so root node, the model properties, it's just informative. The compatible, the kernel is going to use this to identify the board. The CPU's node, inside of, you're going to have a subnode or a child node for each of the CPUs. And then a memory node, there we're going to have a reg property that describes the initial address of the memory and the size. A chosen node that is going to, uh, can be used to pass arguments to the kernel, like the command line arguments. We can use the boot charges properties to pass arguments to the kernel. The kernel will use this uh, command line arguments if defines, defines it. We can define the aliases uh, to define some aliases for some nodes. And then we will have the definition of the buses and devices connected to the buses. So here I have a SOC, a, so, a, a node named SOC, just to, to define that I'm, I'm describing the devices that is inside the system on chip, the SOC. And then I have here a timer device. And then I am describing here a internal SOC bus from IMX, that AIPS. And inside this bus, I have some controllers, like the Ethernet controller and the I2 square, I2C square controller. Inside the I2C square controller, I can have an I2C device, like the audio codec. So that's the main idea. Again, you don't need to, to pay attention to the details right now. We're just trying to get a big picture here of how the we define describe the hardware in the device tree well imagine you have uh, two similar boards are you going to create two similar device trees no because you could have problems to maintain these device trees right so we could create a device tree file that can be included in other device tree files that's the device tree source include file, the DTSI file. And in practice, the device tree is split in several files to make it more modular, so we can reuse the code in the device tree. The final device tree is the DTS, right? But the DTS can include the DTSI files, which can include other DTSI files. And then we can have a very modular and reusable design. I have here an example. So he, this is a real device tree from the kernel source code. This is the device tree from the IMX6 Colibri module from Teradex. 
just part of it, not the full device rule. We can see here that it is including some files, right? Basically, it is including the device tree uh, description from the system on ship. So this IMX CDL dot DTSI file is describing all of the hardware of the SOC. Then it includes a common device tree for use it for all Colibri modules, IMX6 Colibri modules, and then uh, it defines uh, nodes and properties specific to this board. When the compiler is parsing this file, it will first parse the this include, the first include, then we will parse the second include, and if the second include change a node or a property of a node that was already described in the first device to include, it will change it. So it's a kind of overlay uh, the way the compiler handles this. And then in our device tree, we can, you, we can overlay some properties or some uh, nodes of a device tree, right? If we redefine here, uh, what, I'm, what, what we can see here is the following. We have uh, the description of uh, boards that use the IMX6 Colibri module from Toradex, right? This device tree includes the device tree from the uh, system on ship that, that describes the UART1. But the UART1 is described in a way that it is by default disabled, as we can see from this property status. It's disabled. And in our device tree, we are using its label, UART1, to enable it. So we are using the UART1 to enable. Uh, the final device tree, we will have something like that. That node was changed by our device tree. That property status was changed to OK. And we can do that with every property of every node in the device tree. Here is another example of this mechanism of overlay. We have here two modules from Tradex. The Vibrid is based on the Vibrid system on chip. Right? One is based on the Vibrid 50 and the other on the Vibrid 61. It's very similar, but it uses different system on chip. So uh, in terms of boards, we have two boards, right? two modules, but both modules are Colibri Vibrid modules. So it has something in common. Each one uses a different system on chip, SOC, and the SOC is similar in some ways, right? So how do we create a device tree for that? We're going to have a device tree for every case. So every bird has its own device tree, the DTS. Since both boards are Colibri Vibrate modules, it has something in common. So it will include a device tree for the Vibrate Colibri modules. Each board has its, uses its own SOC, so it will include its own DTSI for the specific SOC. But both SOCs are similar, both are vibrant SOCs, so they will include a DTSI, DTSI common to both SOCs. So in this way, we can reuse a lot of the device tree definitions, right? It becomes very easy to maintain a device tree. To end here our presentation, we do some hands-on. How can we find documentation about US3? There is a documentation or a specification of the device tree called device tree binding. So I want to enable uh, an accelerometer. Uh, what's the compatible of this accelerometer? Uh, what, what are the properties that I need to enable uh, to work with this accelerometer? All of this is documented in the device tree bind of that uh, device. Where are the device tree binds located? In the Linux kernel source code. So in documentation, device tree bindings, inside the Linux kernel source code, we will find uh, the documentation of each of the, the device trees 
and for the devices supported by the camera or should be there right here i have an example of the sgtl 5000 the audio codec uh, it's located in documentation, device tree binding, sounds, STL 5000.txt, so it's a text file. We have here the description of the device, the required properties, so it has three required properties. We could have optional properties, this device tree doesn't have it, but we could. And then an example. And that the example is important because we could use it as a, a start point for our device tree to describe this hardware in our device tree. Of course, we, we should check for the address of the device if it is really pin in that case. Uh, we should check for the clock it's going to use, but we have a starting point to describe a device in a device. What I want to do now in our final minutes is some hands-on on the board. I have here connected in my machine a Colibri IMX6 module from Teradex uh, and a Viola board also from Teradex, right? They are connected on my machine uh, through a serial console and through network, right? I will boot the system through Ethernet, uh, my bootloader, I'm using U-Boot. It's configured to load the kernel in the device tree using FTP and then mount the file system using NFS. So everything to the network. Let's try first to create a device tree for that board. I have here, let's see if it's working. So I reboot the board. You can see it's a U-Boot that is running. And then I already compiled the kernel, it's here, boots the kernel, uh, successfully loaded the kernel to memory, and then tried to load the device tree, and it didn't find. Our objective here is to create the device tree. So we are going to create this device tree and try to boot the board, right? So we have here a board that is based on the IMX6 Colibri module. We're going to use that as a reference to create our device tree. So what I'm going to do here, here I am the Linux kernel source code. Here is the main Linux kernel source code. And here I'm inside the uh, Linux kernel source code uh, where the device trees are located. In Arch Army Boot DTS, you can see here all of the DTS files. Right, I'm, I will search for uh, the definition of, the, of a device tree that uses this module and use it as a base for my device tree. So here I can see I will use, uh, I think I will use this one. This is a fine device tree, evaluation board from Prodex. Right, I use this one. I will copy this one to my device tree. I will call it IMXCDL, call it the dash LEDworks. That's my device tree. And I will remove almost everything from the device tree to make it as simple as possible. And then we're going to customize a little bit after testing this device tree. So I am removing everything. I think that I remove more than I should. Okay, a lot of things. Right, we have here the bare bones of a device tree to boot in our board, right? We are including the device tree from the SOC the base device tree for the IMX is Colibri module, and then we can do our customizations here. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just trying to test and boot this device tree. That's a minimal device tree for our board. I will just change here to LabWorks to see if it's working with our device tree, right? I will save it. Then I will compile this device tree. 
here I'm running make with only our device to, to compile it. Okay, it generates a blob. This is a blob, right? I'm going to copy this file to to my TFTP server so the bootloader can can load that boot. Copy it. Then I will reboot the board and see what happened. Okay, uh, it loads the kernel, then loads the, boot, the, the device tree, and then start the kernel. I'm not seeing anything here. I don't have a serial console. Uh, I know I have a SSH server in my board, so I'll try to connect to it using SSH. Okay, I could connect. So it booted with our device tree. Let me see here. CPU info. We have I running a XP IMX6. I can show the kernel command line, the kernel log here, and see if this model is right. Here, that's the contents developed that property model. It's here. Right, we change it to lab works here. So it booted. We can actually have access to device three here. There is a directory in the proc file system. It should be enabled in the kernel, but normally is. Here we have a view of the full device tree that can help in some cases when debugging problems with the device tree. Okay, uh, let's do another test enabling the serial port. So for some reason the UART is not enabled. That's why we can't see here the, the log the, the, the console, the kernel log and everything. Let me open again the device tree. Probably the device uh, description of the UART is disabled. Let's confirm that. I will open the include file for the SOC. That's the include file for the SOC, the MX6. I will look for the UART. And here we have the node that declares the UART. We can see that the status property is disabled. So that's why the UART one is disabled. Let's enable it. We can use this label to enable it. So I'm going to my device tree, reference this label, UART1 and change the property status to OK. That's how we enable a node in a device tree. I'm going to save the device tree. I'm going to recompile it. Copy again to the TFTP server, and then boot again. Very good, now we have Console access, we should go get here a uh, login prompt. Okay, now we have here the TT, the watch one port here. As a final example, imagine that you want to enable advice in advice tool. So, for example, I selected here this device, TSL2563. That's a light sensor that uses I squared C. So uh, how do we enable this device in the system? Remember that you should have both the driver enabled and the device described in the device tree. So first, we should open the kernel configuration menu. We should look for this device. It's here in device drivers, industrial I.O. support, light sensors. We should enable this device. OK, enable. So Actually, I'm not enable the device. I enable the driver that will handle this device. If I compile this code, the kernel updates, it will work. Of course not, because the kernel doesn't know 
that you have this device connected to a I square C bus. So the second part is to enable the device in device tree. So now the question is, what is the compatible for this device? And what are the properties that you should use for this device? Uh, one way to answer that question is to go to the device tree binding directory and look for the binding of this device. So we are looking for TSL 95. Here I can see that it is located in IIO light and then the text file that describes the binding of this device. I will open it. Okay, it's a ambient light sensor device. See, it has uh, two required properties. One is the compatible and the other is the reg and one optional properties. And we have here uh, example. I will copy it and enable in my device tree. First, I need to know uh, in which bus are connected. So let's say, for example, it is connected in I square C1. And then inside the, this node, I will declare my device. And that's how it's done. For every device that you want to enable, you have to enable the driver, you have to uh, describe the hardware in the device tree. So in this slide we have some reference for the documentation. The, the main website for the device tree is device3.org. We have some documentation in the kernel source code, include the binds. There's a very good presentation from Thomas Petazoni from Free Electrons. You can search in the YouTube, you will find it. That uh, describes a lot of things from the device tree road. I hope you could uh, have a good picture of how, what is a device tree, what problem it solves, and how do you use it. I'm going to now uh, hand over the presentation to Brandon so we can start the question and answer session. Great, thank you, Sergio, for that uh, presentation and the demonstration of working with the device tree. So we'll now take some questions. We're already running uh, short on time here, so we're going to take just a few questions here. If we don't get to your question, feel free to reach out via email, and we'll, we'll also try and respond to the questions we don't get to in the webinar via email. And again, also the uh, community website, community.toradex.com is another great place to ask questions. You'll see here on, on this slide our contact information. So again, please don't hesitate to reach out, whether it be technical questions or if you're interested in Toradex products, of course, reach out to your local office. If you're here in the US or in North America, feel free to, to email me directly. So let's get to the questions. We have several here. I'm gonna take them in the order they come. In the syntax, it is unclear what aspects are keywords versus user-defined identifiers or values. Can you please clarify? Sure. That is the, the specification, the syntax of the device tree says that you have to, to define nodes with subnodes, and each node or subnode can have properties. The node, the name of the node is a string. You could use any string, right? And each property is generic key value set. So you define a name of the property and a value for that property, right? And the device tree binding that defines the semantic of that, right? So the binding of it a say device defines that you should declare the property reg with unsigned int integer to describe the address of the device in the I square C bus. So the semantic of each of the properties in the device tree actually depends on the binding definition. I don't know if I answered the question, but, but uh, I, I see it that way. Okay, thanks. Could you make an example to enable a spy interface? And I guess we, we probably don't have too much time 
to create a full example. And, and I know in the case of Tordex device trees, there in some of the device trees we include SpyDev uh, as an implementation. And there's also on some of our Calibri modules support for a SpyCan device. So there are some examples in some of our device trees already. I would say take a look at the uh, documentation on device tree bindings, run a grep for SPI, and then we, you will find a lot of examples of devices that uh, uses uh, the, the SPI bus. It's not that, that difficult. It's the same as we do here with the IISPRC. Okay, great. And also, um, we do have some information covered on our developer website as well, so you can search that for SPI. But um, as mentioned, also searching the uh, kernel source is a great uh, resource. What do you recommend in learning how to use which OF calls and when? Looking at the device, the Linux kernel source code, the, the way I learn is uh, by doing. There is no easy way because there are no books about device tree. It's a kind of technology or concept that's evolving over time. So even if you read something about the device tree, if it was written, I don't know, two or three years ago, maybe there is something different or easier today uh, since the device tree is improving over time. So one of the, the ways that uh, we can use it to learn is actually reading the Linux kernel source code and understanding how it is done and doing. Okay, great. How sensitive is the device tree compiler to white space? For example, strict tabs versus spaces. It is not that sensitive. In that sense, it's like the C compiler, right? So you could write everything in one line and it should work. But to today, the device tree compiler uh, has some, I would say, problems because, for example, it doesn't check if you mistype something, you have a typo in the device tree, right? If you, instead of write compatible, you write compatible, I don't know, something like that to change a letter, it doesn't say to you that you have a typo in your device tree. So one thing that would be good is to take a node and compare it to the binding of that node, that the specification of that node, and say that if, if everything is it's okay or not okay, right? So it doesn't do that. So that's why sometimes you have problems with device tree, you have to debug device tree. There are a lot of tools that I would recommend that uh, it's uh, inside the device tree compiler project. Like there is a tool to do diffs in the device tree, it's a very good tool. There is a tool that is uh, capable of reading all of your device tree, identify all of the nodes and say to you, if you forgot to enable a driver for a device that should describe the device tree, that tool is called dt uh, underscore to underscore config. So it's a very good tool. The, as I said, the device tree, it's evolving over time. So the maintainers are working on some tools to help us the, develop and debug device tree issues. All right, and um, in a board's DTS file, which includes more than one DTSI file, uh, when compiling the DTB, will the compiler create a consolidated final DTB? Yes, that's a quite new feature, actually. Uh, that is an option. You have to compile it by hand using the DTC compiler, and that is an option in the DTC that you can use to indicate to the compiler to generate a final DTS with everything included. So take a look at the DTC help command and you will find the, that option that you, you can use to, to take a DTS that includes a lot of DTS size and generate a final DTS with everything. And that really helps sometimes to identify some properties of some nodes in the device tree. 
And uh, can you uh, talk to any differences that have occurred to the device tree going from Linux 3 to Linux 4? And in, uh, maybe in general, you can just talk about how the device tree has, has evolved over time and, and what we might see in the future. Sure. Well, it's evolving a lot, especially in the tools that help uh, the compiler. So they are uh, implementing a lot of warnings in the device tree to try to catch some common mistakes. Uh, it's not very good, but that's the objective. Some features that they added added over time. For example, in the past, you imagine when you are writing, for example, a device tree, and you're creating a node for button drivers. So you have a, a, a button in your system. You are enable a, a device in the device tree to driver that will handle that button. That's connected to a GPIO. You will have to define the key code for that button. And then in the past, you would have to hard code the key code. And that was not good, of course, because if the key code changes, you have to change all of the device trees, right? So what they done was they make possible to include uh, include files dot h in the device tree i don't know if you saw the the device tree i open one of the slides has the, the include of uh, include file that has a lot of defines and then what happens today the device tree compiler runs a c preprocessor before compiling the device tree that's why Actually, you need uh, to change to compile a device tree because it will run a preprocessor that will preprocessor the include files and substitute all the, the macros and define define in the include file. So that that was one feature created. I don't know when, but it wasn't available in the beginning and were created by were created by the, the community. Could you touch upon the uh, pound address cells and pound size properties? This always causes confusion. The address cell describes how many cells the address of your bus has, and the size uh, describes the how many integers you will use to describe the size of the cell. So, for example. For a device that's connected to a memory map I.O. device, it will be connected to a bus that describes the, the address with one and the size with one. So it will use one integer for defining the address of the device and one integer to define the size of the block of memory used by that device. Another example is I square C bus, where you have the address with the definition of one and the size with the definition of zero. That's because in the I square C device, you just have to define the address. There is no size of that address. So the size of the address in the bus is zero. I think I can uh, answer better that question uh, showing the code, but we don't have here uh, too much time. So I'm going to take the email from the person that sent the question and I try to answer in the email. Are there ways to turn off unused functions to reduce power consumption via device tree? Reduce power consumption with a device tree? In, in theory, the, well, there, there's some, some things here. Uh, of course, if you disable a node in a device tree, compile, generate the DTB, and run it, that device will be disabled. You will, your power consumption will be low. So of course, but of course, you won't have that device. So I think the question was, can we disable at runtime the device maybe to consume less energy? We can do that. There is a, a feature called device tree overlay that makes us able to change a node in a device tree at runtime. We can add a node, remove a node. 
this feature is evolving over time. It's actually a new feature. It was, I think, what's called the past transaction device tree, and they changed it to device tree overlays. So I would suggest to take a look at the device tree overlay feature in the kernel and see if it fits your need. But the feature enables us to change the device tree at runtime, and you can use it to disable a device and make it consume less energy. Okay, great. Um, final question. Bootloaders like U-Boot can read and write a DTB while some hardware must be set up in the bootloader in order to read a DTB from memory. There may be hardware initialization that the uh, bootloader implementation requires. It could use and configure from DTB information. This has not been a feature. Will it be someday? Well, actually today the bootloaders normally change the device tree in some ways. As I said before, that there's a tool called DTX underscore GIF that is able to make GIFs in device trees. So you can pass two blobs, two sources, and you can also compare the final device tree of the board, that directory that I showed, the slash proc slash device tree. We can compare, we can make a copy of that directory and send to our host and compare with the DTB. And we're going to see that the bootloader made some changes. Normally the bootloader changed the device tree to indicate how many memory the, the board has, because this could change over time or dynamic. We could have in, uh, different boards with different memory chips and different memory sizes. The bootloader is able to change the device tree. I don't know if the question is that. Uh, the other thing is some bootloaders today are already using the device tree to describe the hardware, just like the kernel. U-Boot is one of these bootloaders. So today, the U-Boot is using the device tree to describe the hardware for itself, to load the drivers, and do the same thing as the kernel is, is doing. So there is a lot of talk in the community in, in terms of how do we uh, share the, the device tree, so should be a project or the source of the device tree should be shared between different projects like the Linux kernel, the, the U-Boot. There are also another operating systems like BSD. I don't remember if it's free BSD or NetBSD. There are BSD flavor that is using device tree and it's trying to be compatible with the Linux kernel using the same bindings. And that's good because we could use the same device tree blob in different operating systems. We could use the same DTB in U-Boot, in Linux kernel, in uh, BCD flavor, and that's already happened. All right, well, I think that does it for our questions today. There were still some questions which we didn't get to, but uh, again, we'll try and answer those here after the webinar. Thank you, Sergio, for coming on today and uh, talk about device trees. And I hope everybody found that useful. I thank everybody for attending and please give us your feedback and uh, look for our future webinars from Toradex. And uh, you can find a recording of this webinar. It'll be a post in just a few days at toradex.com slash webinars or um, toradex.com slash videos, as well as uh, on YouTube. Again, thank you everybody for coming. We look forward to seeing you in a future webinar. Feel free to contact us if you have any additional questions. Uh, take care, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.